Hello and welcome back. Today I want to look at a somewhat forgotten device which can be used with the purpose of power regulation. It is built around the basic properties of magnetic cores and it allows the amplification of a signal by using something you normally don't consider an amplification device. So it does not involve transistors or vacuum tubes, but rather saturating transformers. What I'm talking about of course is magnetic amplifiers or mag amps. So with an inductor built around a magnetic core, the inductance is related to the physical construction, the number of turns, the coil's length and the coil's area, but another key factor is the magnetic permeability of the core. Now you may remember that a magnetic core is not really an ideal thing. The permeability is not really a constant and it can be influenced by multiple factors. The main effect on which the magnetic amplifier relies is the permeability's variation with the magnetic flux density. The more flux you have, the lower the permeability that you will end up with. Now the exact transition shape is material dependent of course, but you will roughly get this sort of shape. This property can be easily observed if we look into the datasheet of a power inductor. So this is just a random inductor, but this property to some extent will occur on any such component under the right circumstances. So if we scroll down, we have here a graph indicating the inductance versus the applied current. So our 10 microhenry inductor does indeed have 10 microhenries when no current is passing through it, but as current increases, the inductance slowly drops. And while well, this drop is quite small at first, but after a certain point, the drop becomes quite significant. Now, usually in any good datasheet, a saturation current will be defined, so above which the inductance drops by more than a certain amount, for this inductor is defined at 35%. But anyway, the thing to remember from this graph is that the inductance of an inductor with a magnetic core is not a constant. It can have a very large variation once you push the inductor into saturation. Now the inductor is not changing its inductance because of the current, but rather the magnetic core is losing its permeability under high magnetic flux densities. One way to generate this magnetic flux is using a current. But the interesting thing to observe is that the current and thus the flux does not have to be alternating. It can be a constant field. We can easily observe this phenomenon by using a high permeability magnetic core with two windings. So one is connected to the inductance ohmmeter set to the 20 millihenry range, and the other is connected in series with an ammeter, some series resistance, and a DC power supply. So by default, we are getting a relatively high 17.3 millihenry inductance. But once I start to connect some DC current, so a few milliamps at a time, we can see our inductance is also slowly dropping. So with the setup, I can take my 17 millihenry core down to below 100 microhenry. Now the correlation is not perfectly linear. There isn't a linear relationship between the inductance drop and the applied current, but it can be over certain ranges. And when this thing is dimensioned correctly, you need very little control power since the voltage drop on the DC side of the coil is only wire resistant dependent and the current can be reduced by adding in more turns into the inductor. So you can change the inductance of a coil by using a control current. The control current can even be variable as long as its frequency is much smaller than that of the controlled current. But how does this turn into an amplifier? Well, the coil's variable inductance and thus its variable impedance can be used to allow or block the passage of an AC current. Since the power needed to achieve control is smaller than the power that is being controlled, this becomes an amplifier. A basic example to highlight this consists in using an AC voltage in series with some sort of load. So today I'm using a light bulb and on the other side we have the magnetic amplifier which is connected to the DC resistance and an ammeter as before. So the specific AC signal that I'm using 
is a 10 kilohertz 10 volt peak to peak supply. So when I turn this on, the light bulb is off, nothing really happens. But if I start to provide a higher and higher current, so 17 milliamps, nothing happens. 33, light bulb comes on. And when I increase the current, the light bulb becomes on with a stronger brightness. So by changing the resistance and thus the current passing through the secondary, we can change the flux density and thus the inductance of our coil in the magnetic amplifier. With little to no current, we have a high inductance and thus high impedance, so little to no current passes through, but once we saturate the core, the inductance and impedance drops, so more current is allowed. And while well, the light bulb turns on. Now, the nice feature here is that the control is not just a strict on and off. We can have certain degrees of fine adjustment. So although this basic experiment works, this example does have a few issues. So first things first, a magnetic amplifier is still a transformer. If you have an AC signal applied to one end, it will be transformed into the other end. So I set up a basic measurement just to highlight this. So with a basic one-to-one -one transformer, we have a very clear AC voltage on the secondary side. Now this is quite unwanted, since this will be driven into the control circuit of the magnetic amplifier, wasting power and possibly causing damage to it. So one way around this is to use some sort of large value inductor that will act as a radio frequency choke. This works, but you need quite a large inductor. And this also runs the risk of saturation when a DC current is applied. Another slightly better method is to use two transformers in series, but the ends connected in opposing connection. So the induced voltage into the secondary from the primary side should cancel out. Now, although this is a better solution, it does have the limitation that if the two transformers are not perfectly identical, the resulting addition will not be quite zero. So I tried applying this second method with two transformers, and even though the results were better than the version in which nothing was used, a clear sine wave was still visible. Now, anyway, you do have various clever ways of winding the transformers to cancel out the fields, but that's just too complicated. One of the two methods discussed today might be a bit more practical. The other big issue can be better explained using a magnetization loop. So under normal circumstances, in a BH diagram, you have a nicely centered loop. The closer you are to the center, the higher the inductance that you see. And the further away, the closer you are to saturation. Now, when you have only an AC sine wave applied, this loop will be perfectly symmetrical. Now, when a DC field is applied, the loop will be pushed to one side based on the DC polarity, and this will end up deforming only half of the loop. So in this case, it's the upper half that sees saturation, while the lower half does not. Now, the way in which this will manifest in practice is that an applied sine wave will get deformed on one side differently than on the other. So your control signal will only be affecting half of the AC sine wave. Now, one solution to this is to split the incoming AC signal into two halves and have the control DC current act on both of them. And finally, recombining everything back into the load. So this way, the signals, even if deformed, should still be symmetrical when they pass through the circuit. And well, when testing out this circuit, the waveform does indeed look far more symmetrical, the upper half and the lower half have the same value, but because of the diodes, we do see some crossover distortion. So you always need a minimum voltage to drive the diodes with this sort of application. The final feature to mention today has to do with the incoming signal's polarity. So for this experiment, I build a setup that adjusts both sides of the incoming sine wave, so the one with the diodes and the two cores, so that's what I got built here. And right now, I set up the circuit to inject a current of about 22 milliamps. So this clearly turns on the light bulb. And well, if we remove the current, the light bulb turns off. Now the interesting to mention here is if we swap out the polarity of the incoming signal, so I just swap the two bananas on my power supply, 
we have the same 22 milliamp current, but this time the light bulb does not turn on. So, by swapping the polarity of the control signals, you will not get the same effect. However, if we do increase the current to a much higher value, we still can get the thing to work. So, in other words, the response of the circuit is not symmetrical to the incoming signal. The same absolute current value will give different results if the supply is being applied as a positive or as a negative voltage. So this feature is a thing to keep in mind when designing such a circuit. In general, when setting up a magnetic amplifier circuit, you will need to take into account all of these issues. The AC signal needs to be isolated from the control circuit, the AC signal needs to be symmetrically adjusted, and the control signal's polarity matters. This all seems really complicated. And to some extent, it is complicated. Like with any circuit, there is a big difference between the proof of concept and the useful high performance implementation. Now on the Wikipedia page for the magnetic amplifier, we have an example of a audio amplifier based around the magnetic amplifier. So this is based on the work of Mr. Lars Lundell, and well, I have no doubt that this works, but even though it seems quite a complex circuit, a vacuum tube magnetic amplifier combination should have quite a unique sound. Now, another maybe more practical use case for this is within switch mode power supplies. So within this application node, even though quite old, it's still available, and it does discuss this topic in quite a lot of detail. So the idea is that with a power supply that has multiple outputs, you can only regulate one output directly. For every other output, you need either a linear regulator, which is highly inefficient, or an extra switching regulator, which is quite complicated and expensive. Now, at the time when this article was written, the magnetic amplifier was quite a good compromise between the two. You have somewhat of a linear control, but since you're adjusting a reactive element, the losses are relatively small, so it should be more efficient than the linear regulator. However, I cannot say if this sort of design is still in common use today. But anyway, if you're curious, this application note does explain its operation in quite a lot of detail. So, is the magnetic amplifier still relevant in today's world? Well, its big advantages are relatively simple build, very high power handling capability, high reliability, and high radiation resistance. But at the same time, it's quite bulky, and in most use cases, it has been surpassed by semiconductor technologies. It's still an interesting device that can find some niche applications, but in most cases, there are easier ways of doing things. Let me know if you've ever came across such a device in real life. But other than that, hope you enjoyed this video, and if so, there are more similar videos on my channel that you might want to check out. And if you want to be up to date with my latest releases, also consider subscribing. See you next time. Bye bye.